Hello, and welcome to The Psychonaut Show with Dr. J.K.B. This is John K. Burton, M.D., psychiatrist, psychoanalyst. And on this podcast, your captain on these voyages to explore strange new worlds in inner space. Our mission is to uncover knowledge that will ultimately make us more effective, more connected, and more attractive in our daily lives. In this episode, we're going to be exploring the positions of Melanie Klein. Doesn't that sound like the title of that particular film genre about a woman's sexual liberation? It'd be the story about a nice Jewish girl who decides to make her way through the Kama Sutra. Sort of a Fifty Shades of Grey meets Eat, Pray, Love. Though I'd like to think it'd be something a little more literary, like something by Erica Jong. And of course it's not that, but in terms of the drama that we'll encounter in this concept, it's not that far off either. So the idea is this, that there are positions or what we might call worldviews, from which we understand other people, how we think about the world that we live in, or how we understand the world that we live in. And the two, there are only two positions, and they are one, the paranoid schizoid position, and two, the depressed position. Now, these don't sound like great options, I have to admit, but we will see that they can actually be a very useful way to check in with ourselves and how we're understanding other people's behavior and maybe think about reframing that. So the paranoid position sees the world as either all good or all bad, or or rather people in the world as all good or all bad, including oneself. I am great or I'm terrible. It's very black and white. And the problem is because the bad is all bad, it's very, very dangerous and it represents a threat. We can be hurt very badly or even destroyed by this badness. So we spend an enormous amount of energy trying to figure out what is good and what is bad. So an example of this that I like to think about is Superman. Now, Superman obviously was created a long time ago in the comic books and in starting in the 70s and 80s, uh, they, he started to uh, make it into film. But basically, that character was pretty perfect. He was the ultimate hero. His powers were infinite. He was superhuman. And he was always on track in terms of saving people, doing what was right, truth, justice, and the American way. And the villains, of course, were always all bad, and there was no question that they needed to be put away. But with Superman Returns, the movie that came out in 2006, uh, this is the first place that we see a change in that. And generally, this I think this is thought of as not the greatest Superman movie, but to my mind, it's the first place where his flaws can coexist and even strengthen the heroic qualities of his character. The movie explores aspects of his origin story that really had not been paid lots of attention to, like how he feels about his adoption or the demands on him to be the savior of the world and even show him with the terrible flaw in the beginning, like he abandons everyone and how lonely he is. And of course, the movie that followed, Man of Steel, which is generally thought to be a better movie, I think, uh, also uh, shows a character who can be angry and hostile, but that those qualities can actually coexist with his heroic qualities, his compassion and his goodness. And that would represent the depressed position. But let me give you an example of this in real life. So this is a situation that came up with a man that I was seeing in my practice. He was 28 at the time, but we'd been seeing each other for, you know, a few years talking about confusion that he had about his career choice, but a lot about his relationships with women. He had dated a lot of different women and 
at that time, he had developed a relationship that was more serious than he had had before. And they ended up deciding to live together. And they really felt strongly about one another. But like in a lot of relationships, they also had a lot of conflicts and stresses that came up. And over the course of the time that they were together, it became clear to them that despite their love for one another, the the stresses between them, the conflicts between them just couldn't be worked out. And they decided that they needed to be apart. They needed to break up. And, you know, breakups can be um, ones that are mutually agreed on. And on the other hand, they can be very bad with a lot of anger and hurt. And my patient felt that his situation was the former, and he really wanted it to be that way. They they talked about it, they had a good conversation, and he felt that they really understood one another's points of view and were grateful for the relationship they had and were ready to move on, and ultimately she decided to move to her own place. And it seemed like it was going in the right direction. He was sad, but he felt resolved. But then not long after that, something happened. He got a volley of texts from her of a really bad nature, like, I hope you die. And even like random, really angry things like you're a rapist and you should be in jail. Um, Clearly very angry, not in a place that they had been before being able to, to talk about things. And he didn't understand what was going on at all. And he was really confused and upset about this. Also really pulled into the situation, really angry at her back. He, he felt at the same time very bad. Like what had he done that was so terrible? And it was just very confusing. And when we talked about actually Melanie Klein's positions, the paranoid schizoid position, this actually helped him to think about what was going on and to understand it. And he realized that she was making him an all bad person, an all bad, as they say, in the object relations school that Melanie Klein founded, a bad object because he was the object of her hostility. And she only felt anger and hostility towards him. He was all bad and he felt like he was all bad and he felt like she was all bad. And understanding that this is what was going on, they were in the paranoid schizoid position, and then thinking about that allowed him to see why, is that in their relationship, it actually wasn't all bad. They really did love one another. There were times when it was actually really good. And that that was really, really sad. And in a way, it was even too painful to recognize that making it all bad allowed her to not have to deal with the fact that she was losing something good, to not have to deal with the sadness. And thinking about it in this way allowed him to move on, to put it in perspective. He could think about this, and it wasn't necessary that she think about it too, but he could realize what this was all about. And then he could recognize, even if she didn't, he could recognize that, yes, there was good in it, that she was just angry that she wasn't all bad, that he wasn't all bad. And it was sadness about letting go, but that recognizing that sadness and dealing with that pain allowed him to sort of resolve this and move on and not get stuck in that situation. So let me get a little deeper into the theory just to really bring it forward and and get clarity on it. Melody Klein always claimed that she adhered closely to Freud's original ideas. But the truth is, is that she added ideas that if they were not actually directly contradictory, they were very radical from what Freud had established. For one thing, she theorized that the infant in the first six months of life had a very rich and dramatic fantasy world, a world of imagination with fully formed experiences, nothing to do with reality, but they were fully formed. This is really different than Freud's idea that really didn't pay a lot of attention to the first period of life. He just thought the infant was sort of this 
quivering lump of drives. Um, she really evolved the idea of what is going on in the infant at that time. And one of the ideas that um, Melanie Klein had is that the infant has to manage the experience of the mother who feeds him and cares for him with the mother who occasionally leaves him hungry. Now that I say occasionally because that's from the adult point of view. Then the a well taken care of infant is never left a long time by itself. But she was saying from the infant's point of view, the experience of being hungry and not knowing when they're going to be fed or comforted creates this incredible frustration and anxiety. And that the infant actually imagines that the mother is these different beings, this all good mother and all bad mother. And she really called it the all good breast and the all bad breast, the good breast and the bad breast. And, and that's a thing that's attributed to Melanie Klein. Also that, that people become parts of people. So people are a breast rather than a person. You know, Freud brought up aggression, but didn't get into it as much as she did. She really focused on aggression as well as libido, as a fundamental drive. And this is where the idea of the paranoid schizoid position comes from. It's the first thing that we feel. And then as we begin to realize that the good mother and the bad mother, the good breast and the bad breast come from the same place, we have to mourn the fact that we don't have this ideal, perfect, good mother that's going to take care of us at all times. And that's what brings us to the depressive position. The depressive position is more mature and more evolved, but it's more problematic because you have to grieve that this ideal perfect thing is not possible. It doesn't exist. And that's a really, really difficult thing to do. And not being able to do that, not being able to deal with the grief keeps us in the paranoid position where we split. That's another thing attributed to Klein that we split things, all good, all bad. And the reason for the split is that if we imagine that the bad and the good exist, we worry that the bad will be so bad that it completely annihilates all the good. So that splitting actually protects the good from the bad in the mind of the child in this theory of Melanie Klein. And so Throughout our life, according to her, we go back and forth between these two positions. The depressed is more evolved, and that's kind of where we want to get to, realizing that people are three-dimensional, they're human beings, no one is perfect, but that requires that we accept the loss of the ideal, uh, the loss of what we really fantasize and want for. And especially under times of stress, we will retreat, go back to that paranoid schizoid position, kind of like in the example I gave under the stress of the breakup and what's going to become of me. I want to tell you about Melanie Klein herself and who, because who is this person that came up with these ideas? And it's a pretty interesting backstory. Imagine the world of psychoanalysis after Freud's death. World War II is raging and the circle of Freud circle has fled from Vienna where the Nazis have taken over and gone to London. Anna Freud has at the last minute rescued her father from the jaws of the Nazis, pleaded with them. She's the dedicated daughter, single, childless, and the heir apparent to her father's legacy. And they go to London, but in London already, Melanie Klein has been there and she has established her own ideas and she has a dedicated group of followers. These two women, Melanie Klein and Anna Freud, became the most powerful voices in this crucial stage in the history of psychoanalysis after Sigmund Freud's death. It's like, imagine the United States after George Washington's presidency. What is going to become of this little nation? And it is incredible that what had been, and later would often be, especially in this country, a field dominated by men, was led, in fact, by two women. Neither of them were physicians. Both of them 
were focused for the first time in the history of the field on the minds of children. One was the founder's own daughter, and the other was his patient. Although it is widely believed that Sigmund Freud did in fact take Anna as his patient as well, though that's not widely discussed, as that would be, <laughs> that's very problematic, obviously. But remember, these were the early days and things were not set in stone. Things were not clear. It was a whole new world. Melanie Klein and Anna Freud were great adversaries at this time. Klein famously said, I am a Freudian, but I am not an Anna Freudian. This is a case of life imitating art, or in this case, imitating psychoanalysis. Now, with all of the circle now in London, the founder is dead, World War II is going on, and they are fighting their own world war for who is going to say what becomes of this body of work. Klein's theories were thought to be so heretical that she and her followers, Susan Isaacs, Joan Riviere, and others, were required to defend themselves before the British Psychoanalytic Society in what became known as the Controversial Discussions. Another great movie title, I think. There's so much drama here. The Controversial Discussions, and they occurred between 1941 and 1946. Now, I've heard it said that Freud gave us the father, focused on Oedipus and castration anxiety, but Klein gave us the mother, the good breast, the bad breast, the paranoid schizoid position between the infant and the mother. Now, if you look at Melanie Klein, I'm not sure if she is the mother we would want to have. Her son actually committed suicide, and her daughter became a psychoanalyst herself and one of the most outspoken critics in the controversial discussions towards her own mother. Ultimately, everyone survived these controversial discussions. Some people say because it was in England and England's all about negotiation or compromise or whatever. That's a stereotype. But ultimately, it did create three separate but related schools of thought within the psychoanalytic society. So you can see in the history of psychoanalysis an enormous amount of drama around these concepts of Klein and, and the person of Melanie Klein and her theories. And as I pointed out, her theories are particularly useful in times of drama, in the breakup of relationships, when we're under stress, when we're wanting to see the world in very black and white ways. It has also been useful for some of my patients who have been very distraught during the um, presidential campaign. Was thrown out of his rally today. Where people became very extreme with each other, calling each other n names, and it seemed like there was no place for understanding one another. And quite frankly, in the first few months of the presidency, it, it, sometimes we wonder, a lot of times we wonder if it's actually any better. There's so much extreme name calling and just an inability to uh, understand, uh, even willingness to understand each other. And one young man I was seeing was very interested in what was going on in politics. He was reading the, the listservs and, and the bulletin boards and, and actually getting quite depressed about what he was seeing in the state of the world that we were living in. And again, sort of thinking about this concept that's 80 years old helped him think, okay, this is what's happening and this is what we need to do. We need to realize that we're not all good or all bad and that that's when we can begin to kind of see each other as human beings, as three-dimensional with our own stories, grieve that we know what the right way is, and we know the ideal, and we know who's bad, and we know who's good, but then it opens up some possibilities for discussion, but it's also a more optimistic world to live in. The paranoid schizoid position, speaking of politics, reminds me of the TV show House of Cards. The main character, played by Kevin Spacey, is just aware all the time that everyone around him could wish him harm, and he's constantly plotting and imagining what he needs to do, and he himself can uh, stoop to very evil, bad levels as a result of kind of living in this very paranoid world where everyone is out to get you. 
an example of the paranoid schizoid position where things are all bad or all good actually comes to mind when I listen to President Trump and before the election, candidate Trump talking about immigrants, particularly the Syrian refugees. And I remember him at a campaign speech saying, if you are in this country from Syria, let me tell you, you will be going home. And the crowd roaring its approval, but there's kind of this hostility and anger to the roar. And you imagine the refugees being expelled. The idea that these are people who are going to take jobs, who, who are bringing terrorism, they're just all bad and they need to be expelled. That completely changed after the footage of the chemical warfare attack on the Syrian people by the Assad regime. Of a chemical weapons attack and according and to intelligence And President Trump saying, this changed insane. my mind. Now I'm seeing these people, these children, these, quote, beautiful, beautiful babies. babies. <laughs> and it wasn't them. like oh, I see that the Syrians are really human beings. It was beautiful babies. It was so extreme, like they're wonderful and perfect and innocent. And that to me is a perfect example of splitting. He's talking about the exact same people. They're no different. But in one case, they're all bad and they need to be gotten rid of. In the other case, they're innocent and beautiful and they need to be rescued. They're the same people realizing that they're three-dimensional, that they comprise both good and bad, and we do too, and we can only strive to be the best, is what we ought to be striving for, I think. But again, this is about looking at our inner worlds. It's maybe, I'm not trying to direct policy here, or maybe sometimes we need to feel like we're clear about what's all good and what's all bad. But it is a really good example of splitting and the paranoid schizoid position. So what is the lesson here? The lesson is that there are these ideas of the positions of the paranoid schizoid and the depressive, and we can translate that as a worldview. In the paranoid schizoid position, everything is black and white. You're either all good or all bad. Everyone is either all good and all bad. It's a two-dimensional world. There is a certain clarity to that. I know how things stand and I know how to protect myself. That's the main emphasis of the paranoid schizoid position, to protect myself from the bad, because if the bad comes into the picture, it can destroy all of the good. So creates clarity, but there's an enormous amount of energy spent vigilantly looking at who is bad and who is good. When we realize, when we achieve ambivalence, when we recognize that things are not all good or all bad, they're a mix, we enter into a multicolored, three-dimensional world of human beings. But in order to do that, we have to go through something very painful, which is to grieve the loss of the ideal, the perfect, the all good, to recognize that it doesn't exist. And that can be a very difficult thing to do, particularly in times of stress when we so much want to have clarity and to know that someone somewhere out there is our superman, is our savior. But by recognizing that we can't have that, we actually achieve a higher level of maturity and perspective and can function better with ourselves and with each other. This is Dr. JKB signing off. Since we are exploring together, you make the journey all the richer by subscribing to the show on iTunes. And even better if you also leave a rating, it helps others to find us. If you have a story about how the concept in this episode helped you figure out something in your life, send it in, please. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter at Psychonaut Show. Show notes are on the website, thepsychonautshow.com. And if you leave me a question, it may well be an inspiration for an upcoming episode. Until our next trip, judge nothing, question everything. And remember, there's always a reason. Bye for now. The Psychonaut Show was created and produced by yours truly, John Burton. Art and web design by Hunter Creative. 
Post-production and sound design by Julio Gonzalez of Zimmer Media. Zimmer Media can be found online at zimmer.co. That's X-I-M-E-R dot C-O. 